Well, my Apollo gate stopped working the other day, and in typical fashion, it sent me down a long and arduous path of upgrades and repairs that I've condensed for your viewing pleasure. I don't like cutting corners and decided to go all out on this repair so that I won't have any issues in the future. As y'all just saw, the box containing the control equipment was in rough shape. The whole bottom had been rusted out, probably due to its proximity to the ground and an anthill infestation a few years ago, which held an abnormal amount of moisture in the box. With the paint flaking off in the motor housing, I decided to remove it all with a wire wheel. The pivot was just an old one half of an inch bolt and after some sanding, I was able to get it out of the housing. The first thing I thought could have been wrong with the system was the wiring coming into the motor housing. The shield on the cable had been busted and I saw exposed wires, so I cut back the cable and re-established the connections. The cutback cable will be cleanly protected in the plastic cable gland upon reassembly. I used a putty knife to remove any old silicone on the mating surfaces and then applied a fresh bead of my own. These motor housing bolts were then torqued to pretty snug, which is probably what the manual calls out. Next up, I replaced all of the fuses since it's a super easy and cheap thing to try. With the new fuses and a rigged up fresh button, I tested the unit. It appeared to be working, so at this point I was feeling pretty confident in my repair. We'll find out later that there was more to the story of this malfunction. To replace the rusted out control box, I found this Viver enclosure on Amazon. It's literally the cheapest one I could find, and from what I can tell, it is an upgrade from the Apollo box. One thing I really like about this enclosure and enclosures like it is the elevated mounting plate. This will allow us to mount our equipment without drilling through the box itself. The bottom access panel won't be used during this project, so I installed the gasket and cover. I also installed the grounding wire from the body of the enclosure to the door for good measure. In order to protect the back of our control board, I made some custom risers from this piece of UHMW plastic. They're about a quarter of an inch tall. I laid out the Apollo 635 board along with the remote receiver on the mounting plate so that I can mark hole locations. I can't remember the exact bit size I used, but I drilled these holes so that the self-tapping sheet metal screws I had on hand wouldn't have to do too much work establishing threads. On the side of the box, we'll be drilling three holes for the push button, the push button lock, and the remote antenna. Drilling thin metal is always a bit of a pain, but I was able to get the job done with high RPMs on the drill. I then cleaned up the hole's edges with a round file. Via email, I confirmed with Apollo that these control boxes do need ventilation, so I will be installing two stainless steel vents in the same locations as the original box. One vent will be on the bottom right and the other will be at the top left, which will hopefully allow for cross flow through the enclosure. We'll be making some pretty big vent holes, which will require a one half of an inch center pilot hole as a starter for the tool I'm about to highlight. This tool is a manual hole puncher, which was one of those items I thought I'd only use once, but in reality, I've used it for three separate projects so far. It allows you to put nice clean holes in the sheet metal enclosures like this one. I'll be working up to the largest size in the kit, and in order to do this, we'll need to start with the one half of an inch conduit drift first, so that the larger center screw can fit for the bigger sizes. The biggest size is around 2.4 inches in diameter and is for two inch conduit. This was actually a ton of work and required a large amount of effort to get through the box. I probably could have made it easier on myself by using a long cheater bar, but decided instead that I needed to work out. After I had time in between sets to dry scoop some pre-workout and snort an ammonia cap, I repeated the process on the second hole. I want my enclosure to be as watertight and bug proof as possible, so I ordered this sheet of 1 8 of an inch gasket material to make some custom vent gaskets. My custom made leather head knife did a great job at profiling these out.
To keep the bugs out, I cut some stainless steel mesh. I'll be sandwiching the mesh in between the gasket and the vent with a little bit of silicone in between for good measure. One thing I did a poor job at showing in this footage is the extra set of holes I put into the stainless steel vents. I found these holes necessary to reduce any gapping around the vent. At the very bottom of the box, I drilled two holes for the motor cable and the solar panel cable. Both of these holes will be accepting cable glands to aid in the enclosure's waterproofing. The original box just had these cables coming through an open hole with no seal, and this was the location that the bugs entered my old box. With it being pretty hot outside, I decided to get as much installed in the box as possible inside my shop. This pretty much comes down to the control board, remote receiver, push button, push button lock, and antenna. If I remember right, this wire I'm using is some 14 gauge wire I had from another project, but don't quote me on that. Alright, I'm going to make sure that this stuff is working properly. I'm going to put the barrel key into the lock, uh, just in case we have to unlock it. I think it's unlocked right now. And then we'll start testing to see if there's connectivity between these points. So first of all, you have this jumper going from the button to the lock. So that should automatically be connected. And it is. Then we'll go over the button itself. So this is a push button, meaning it's normally closed. So I have it on both probes here and you hear nothing. Now I'm gonna hold it on both probes and then press the button and you should hear a beep. Now we're gonna go from the far side of the lock to the near side of the button, just to make sure that we're getting a connection through the lock. And we are. Let's lock the lock with the barrel key. All right, and see if we get any sound going through this lock. All right, and that's a no, unlock, and it's a yes. I know for many of you that the conductivity test I just did was a little boring, but I've really come to love having a nice voltmeter, and a little test like that really helps me stay familiar with its operation. I recommend every DIYer have one, and we'll put an affiliate link to the cheap one I used in the description below. At the very top right of the box, I installed the coax cable connector and antenna. I added a washer and gasket to this connector since I made the hole a little too big for the nut. The last thing I do before heading outside to the gate is to install the supplied mounting feet. At the gate, I start off by reinstalling the motor with a fresh grade 8 one half of an inch bolt. I marked out where I want the box to land and drilled some quarter inch mounting holes in my fence bars. Using mounting brackets like the ones supplied with this enclosure are really nice since they give you a little bit of wiggle room to get the box exactly where you want it. With the box mounted, I threaded the solar panel wire and motor wire through their respective cable glands at the bottom. One note here is that in order to utilize the cable gland without taking the motor housing back apart, I need to cut off the plug and reconnect once back in the box. These Wago lever nuts are fantastic by the way, I really wish I knew about them sooner for my DIY projects. They'll be linked in the description with the rest of the stuff. Here I'm using some wood blocks to temporarily support my new Mighty Max battery off the bottom of the enclosure. We'll change this later in the build with something more appropriate. At this point I tested the gate and it was working. I thought I was out of the woods, however, later we'll find out that I wasn't. Since I didn't know that wrinkle at the time, I started working on some other components of the gate. Firstly, I decided to get a new grease gun and grease the hinges. This was the most cost-efficient gun I could find, along with some premium red grease. The bottom hinge greased up perfectly and I pumped it till I got clean grease coming out of the other side of the hinge. The top hinge didn't quite work out that way and we actually popped the insert style fitting out of the hinge. I tapped it back in and tried it again with the same results. I 
I then got online and ordered a pack of replacements and reinstalled one using a socket as a driver. When I pressured up on this one, it didn't pop off. However, you can see I started getting grease out of the threads of my grease gun fittings. I decided to leave this alone, but I'm guessing I have an obstruction in the hinge somewhere. To finish her off, I cable tied the wires to the fence to make things tidy and printed out a PETG custom stand to hold my battery level at the bottom of the box. I'm not sure anyone is ever going to copy this install, but if you do, I'll put the CAD files for this battery stand in the video description for you to download. Now the gate worked for about 12 hours after this and then died again. With some more online research, I concluded it was the control board that went out. Honestly, there wasn't much else in the system that I could replace, and I had verified that the gate motor and actuator worked just fine. I ordered this 636 control board off of eBay since it is the direct replacement for the discontinued 635 board. Note that I confirm with the manufacturer that the US Automatic Patriot control board is no longer a replacement for the Apollo gates. The 636 board bolted in perfectly without issues. I did have to adjust the sensitivity knob slightly so that the gate would stay shut and open all the way. I noticed that my gate was over opening past my grass line, which it had been doing for a long time before it broke, so I decided to fix that while I was working on it. This part is pretty easy to fix and all you need to do is to adjust some of the travel screws on the back of the motor housing. So that's the install. It ended up being more intense than I planned, but hey, that seems to be how these home projects normally go. Truthfully, I'm okay with that since I always get a chance to learn something new and pick up a few more skills when knocking them out. If y'all enjoyed this video and my approach to DIY videos, please consider subscribing to the channel. With that, this is Redbeard Engineered, signing off.